I'm Ole, and from Rotterdam, on board of the Waterling, this is... Art Safari! <laughs> Proust. <laughs> In Art Safari, we cut our way through the jungle that is the contemporary art sector, and today we do this with Jeroen Jungelein. Jeroen. Yes. You are an artist who resides in Rotterdam. And recently you've become quite well known for your running in circles. Yeah. Well, well known. Yeah, you're quite renowned by now. And at least in, in Rotterdam, you're... I'm world famous in you're, Rotterdam. You're world famous in Rotterdam. <laughs> 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 no, but are you, are, you, are you showing this work in... Um, uh, abroad as well because you you had a, yeah. some shows in Amsterdam and uh, where where can we find your work nowadays? It's uh, it's been around. I mean, not not really super super extremely international, but um, I'm doing my stuff now for 25 years more or less, and uh, I always had a quite an international practice, but not extremely. It's like I mean, I I'm really Rotterdam based. And um, what I'm doing is um, uh, I use this as a as a hub, and from here going into Europe mostly. I yep. mean, I do some stuff in the United States sometimes. I've been doing some stuff in New Zealand and some other places, but the majority is in France, Belgium, Germany, England now and then. This kind of stuff. So it's no. European. And you are um, you work with uh, quite an extraordinary material in your practice, because usually when you you know when people draw, then you have the idea of drawing on a surface that is portable, or that you can put on the wall afterwards. But you're drawing in a landscape. Yeah. By running in circles. Well, I'm. Um Oh, how, yeah, how would you how would you say that? What, what kind of discipline is it? Well, normally, if if people ask me what I do, I kind of as a kind of a jokey tongue in cheek kind of thing. I I, I sketch myself as a professional vandalist, and um, I used to have a background in graffiti, and uh, but I was not so much interested in the style of things like how to spray spray paint something or this kind of airbrushy style. But but I liked them. Um, the approach of intervening into the into uh, the urban landscape, and for me it was a tool to to kind of um, uh, to investigate the surrounding, and I use different tools to kind of you know stickers, spray can things, I, I put up banners or all kinds of kind of um, elements that I throw in into the into the public space, and I just kind of look at what happens next yeah and at the same time i'm photographing all kinds of things like all kinds of litter and noise that i can find um what the city offers me like some some wheel covers broken glass or whatever all kinds of other people's graffiti etc etc and um this is kind of like um, a way of sketching let's say i photograph this I make hundreds of, of photographs uh, weekly and uh, I kind of order them in, in small folders. And by doing so, trying to reflect on the city and my position um, in it. And one of those um, elements that I, um, that I was intrigued by are these kind of shortcuts in parks. And uh, so the park is designed in a certain way by... by by designers, by city planners, uh, by architects, etc., and uh, like a, a, a beautiful path is meandering through the green, but people completely uh, ignore it and they they take the shortcut, yeah. and these shortcuts uh, they become uh, real paths after a while, and uh, I photograph them. And I really I, I like the um, the kind of this this anarchistic potential that it has. Everybody is walking them, no matter if you're a young progressive or you're uh, whatever. You know, everybody is doing it, and people use it without thinking. And I thought this is really an, uh, an intriguing thing. This is what art in public space should be, in my definition. You know, like as an artist, I'm interested in in uh, what art 
what kind of function art has in public space. And uh, and for me, these shortcuts, olifante paadjes, they're called in Dutch, like elephant paths or habit trails, or there's, there's many, uh, many labels that people give them. But uh, what I, I, I th think was fascinating is that... Um, um well i mean that there's a parallel between these paths and and what what art should be you know like you have a big sculpture in the middle of a of a roundabout and like a, a, a big plinth and on it like some some funny sculpture and um and people look at it for three seconds and that's it and it becomes part of the thinking or not and oh, it's just a, a everyday question mark that's it. But those those shortcuts, everybody takes them, and mm -hmm. I thought it was intriguing. Like this is what art should be. Like that, you invite people to 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 come along with you along this trail, and uh, walk this path without them knowing actually that they are part of this this um, behavior. Let's say. And um, well, I mean. I decided to just make my own paths. And uh, first I made really um, functional paths that other people could potentially walk. But then after a while I decided to make it more um, abstract and more as a tribute to the, the shortcuts and to make my own individual paths in the middle of the field, in parks themselves and after in some, uh, some, some uh, agricultural fields, uh, Weilanden, I don't know. English word, Weiland, is a, mm, a pasture, a pasture. So in pastures, and um, yeah, and and then so and then they became more and more abstract, really. And then um, after a while, I decided to just it, it, for some reason after uh, doing this for like a year or two, experimenting with different shapes, I decided to end up simplify it into a circle. That's oh. it. I just run circles now. I don't do anything else anymore. I did long lengths. I did squares, cubes, labyrinths, the whole lot. Um, I run from Rotterdam to Berlin at a certain time. So I, my body was really prepared to, to be used as a tool and uh, to be able to create my own uh, shortcuts in, um, in full length. And, uh, and then the, the most challenging for me uh, turned out to be uh, running a circle because it's there's no um, excuse to look away while doing it because if you look away, you're distracted and, and then the track will not be very uh, sharp. So you need to be super um, uh, concentrated. Mm -hmm. And then for two hours, three hours, four hours, depending on the surface, sometimes it's half an hour, uh, you run a, a, a parkour a circle and uh, and then the drawing is slowly made. It appears itself, or it it, it manifests itself. So uh, yeah, and and this is like I'm doing this now for like two years more or less. And um, the yeah, the circles, the circles only, oh, yeah. and uh, I document them as well. And after I documented it, I can kind of take some distance from it and and start having my own reflections about it. And um, what is interesting now is that it, for me, it's like it, it became more and more abstract, more uh, specific, let's say. And now comes a time that I start to um, also be more specific about the, the, the spots where I make my drawings, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. where I make my circles. Mm -hmm. So uh, well, how, how long did it? take for you to hone the, the, the skill of running uh, such lengths? Because when you you were talking about two hours earlier, yeah. running for two hours. Which is about half a marathon. Yeah, because that, that um, running from Rotterdam to Berlin, I don't imagine you do it in one go. Yeah. Did you do it in one go? Yeah, really? well, I mean, I mean, I had to sleep and oh, okay. eat and pp and all that stuff <laughs> but uh but yeah i run like uh in it's, it was like a relay run i run from eight o'clock in the morning until eight o'clock in the evening more or less and um and i i stopped 
at the end of the first day and this is exactly the point where the next day would start again and so on and so on and in the end it took me like about 740 750 kilometers like in uh, in a little bit less than two weeks like in 12 days and uh, so yeah, i okay. ran about like uh, 60 65 kilometers per day at uh, at at least the second second week and uh, so but but so I, I I started running about like I think like eight years nine years ago now. It started just like I was fed up being uh, unfit. I smoked, I drank, and I don't know, all that kind of stuff. And I thought, okay, let's just do do some movement. And at the same time, I was then intrigued by this <coughs> by this uh, shortcuts. So and then I <coughs> decided, okay, let's start training for this to, to be able to do the shortcuts and then i i did this uh short calculation like if i want to do a if i want to run a, a share a, a square shaped figure in the grass of like five by five by five meters or something like that it it would take me about like you run i i didn't want to walk i want to I wanted to run it it's like uh you know, Richard Long did this kind of stuff in the 60s where he was walking one distance and he created, through that, he created a, a line in the grass. And I wanted to do a kind of a reference to that as well, but from a 21st century point of view. So I needed to run it. It's because nowadays everything goes much faster. Everything goes faster. <laughs> um, his career changed in a certain way after the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, until now, like he goes out into the, the countryside, very romantic, leaving the city behind, you know, going into the wild nature. Well, where I'm standing in the 21st century, I don't believe very much in the wild nature anymore. Everywhere we, we look for telephone connection, we see airplane hmm. stripes over the head, uh, there's PFAS plastics everywhere. You name it, you know, from the North Pole to to the deepest uh, points of the Sahara. So um, even the Mar Mariana Trench, they they found some, some yeah, plastic it's, bags. Yeah, it's it's around, horrific, so. you know. But it's like really in the in the we are now in a time that if you want to reflect on the position of art in the landscape and and think about land art and all this kind of stuff, it's like the landscape changed, you know, and it's like uh, deformed and we are now on a point that, um, yeah, we, I mean, I think we need to do certain uh, statements about this, you know, like being less romantic and uh, more tragic, let's say. You know? But at the same time, the way how you were talking about working uh, urbanly as an artist mm -hmm. still had a quite a romantic element to it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it almost, it, it reminded me that immediately about the Roman romantic way of looking at nature, but then how you looked at the urban landscape. Uh, you know, what the what the people in uh, painters would do in the 1900s, they would go and take their canvas out of the city and go and paint a, well, a forest. Well, it looks like that. that it's, yeah, it's true, but it, it looks like that. But if you, see the f if you see a certain video, like me running a circle in some grass, the thing is, like, if you would zoom out or take the camera in a different angle, you see that I'm not running just on a grass field, but that I'm running on a, on a, on a geluidsscherm, like the sound barrier between the city and the industrial area just next to the motorway, just yeah. around the corner. Yeah, yeah. So if you zoom out, you see me running in what pretends to be nature, or we would label it as, as free nature, but it's really just a park. Yeah. Like the urban is now everywhere. You know, like the cities expanded in such a way that um, you cannot, you know, like when I was running from Rotterdam to Berlin, for example, the idea was to run a huge line, a straight line from, from these two um, cities all across uh, the Netherlands and in Germany, across uh, Europe, partly. And this line, um, it was filmed as well, and the line would portrait... Uh, portrait um, uh, this 700 kilometer stretch of urbanism. No. You know, like everywhere I ran, there was some some buildings around, uh, suburbia things, uh, warehouses, factories, etc. So, 
you you cannot walk away at least not from where I'm standing. <clears throat> yeah, but even when you were talking about uh, spray painting and uh, making interventions in in the city, the urban and landscape, yeah, uh, it sounds very. Um, as though you romanticize the urban landscape as if it is idyllic in a way that they were talking about the romantic landscape that outside of the cities before. As if you're looking for a certain degree of beauty inside of an environment that other people would say is quite ugly or, you know, uh, people would usually combine or label nature as beautiful mm. and the urban as the ugly side of the, of the world. Yeah, when I you, you I know, yeah, I wouldn't see it in such a way that it's like uh, romantic in that sense, you know? Like, I mean, I, I look for exit points, you know? And uh, I live in exit, the city. Exit from what? Yeah, exit from the frames that people give. I mean, there is a, a tendency from the from how I was raised that the land, like being outside of the city, it's beautiful, it's rustique. And in the city, there's the, the tension and the pressure, etc. Well, I'm I'm a product of the, of the city. And, but I'm, uh, of course, I'm I'm aware of the codes of the of the countryside, etc., and uh, of the outs, the great outdoors, and all that stuff. But um, the city is part of me, and of in the DNA of what I'm looking, how I'm looking, and the traces that I want to leave behind, uh, that I want to share as a kind of a possibility for reflection about the city. And it's it's not. I have nothing to say about the countryside. I don't know anything about the countryside. If I or 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 the nature, wild nature or something. If you put me in the middle of a forest in the Amazon, still I'm. I will create with the language of of the of the, the citizen. Yeah. You know, and um, and of course it's a reflection on the nature, but at the same time reflection on the city. And uh, yeah, as I said, you know, for me the city is now everywhere. And um, so I don't I don't see it as such uh, uh, being romantic in that sense. You know, it's more like um, I use the tools of the rustique. You know, like uh, the impressionist going out into the countryside with the easel, doing some oil paint or some sketches. They come back to the to the city, to the studio where they would work on their painting, and uh, it's it's. I use that tool, but I sketch a portrait of the city, you yep. know, like now I, I just was like for two weeks then in, in Belgium and France and uh, going into the countryside, let's say, but I go into, uh, I make my, my running circles there and, and, and photographing them, documenting them. Um, but they are, I mean, I, I, I'm there in this kind of agricultural setting, beautiful slopes and hills, and the landscape is really picturesque. But it is a history book I'm running in, the representation of the, the First World War in the media that is going through my mind. Um, it's the, the war in uh, Ukraine, that's on my mind. Um, it, the reflections of how uh, landscape art from the 50s and the 60s and the 70s is relevant uh, nowadays. You know, so it's all kind of, uh, and it's from a, a standpoint of a Dutch guy living in Rotterdam. So that all those elements are parameters um, that I use to build my my uh, my sketches, my language. Yeah. Say. Because then you, you're running, um, you say you're running in a history book. You literally run in the fields where the first first World War took place. Yeah. And you posted some pictures on, on Facebook as well yeah. of um, mortar shells that you found. That you even brought one with you. With like a, yeah, like a piece a, of shrapnel. Piece of of shrapnel. Bomb. Yeah. Wow, yeah. It's an, it, it looks really beautiful. It's really good colors. Yeah, it's a, it's like 100, uh, 120 years, 100, uh, 100 and what is it? 100, uh, 105 years in the in the mud of a uh, teep um, uh, potato field mm -hmm. you know rusty rusting away but uh, yeah i found some other weird bombs today as well like a kind of a grenade that uh, it was still intact so i just left it there it was too dangerous to take it along but i mean it's there already and people are pushing it around 
there's tractors driving over it, but still it's like, uh, it's too tricky to, um, to take it. And, uh, yeah, like for the last three days, every day I found live hand grenades or shrapnel or, or like uh, grenades or, um, I think the one I found today was like, um, uh, it was like a, um, a grenade that you stick in your gun and then you could shoot it like a kind of a, a small mortar, mortar yeah, kind wow. of thing. But you deliberately go and visit these kind of places. Yeah, not you, not to stumble over the the mines and, and bombs <laughs> and stuff. That's not the aim. But it, I mean, I'm 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 not afraid of it. You know, it's of course it adds to the to the little uh, adventure pleasure for me. You know that it's a bit uh, scary. I don't do it with permission, so that's also kind of like that's that's my typical graffiti um, DNA. You know, to to not you know, pre-plan this like weeks in advance, write the farmers if I'm allowed to run a circle mm -hmm. in their in their fields, etc. That's too complicated for me and too uh, too inefficient. And uh and the risk is of course like um yeah that you stumble in onto these kind of weird things, you know? And of course the story is that it's super dangerous to step on a mine and to da 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 but it's like, I mean, this stuff is really old, you know, and uh, it's less dangerous than people um, uh, sketch it, you know. So this, this is your conclusion, or it's it's, <laughs> it's my conclusion, but it's also what I heard um, of people uh, that I spoke last week. Like sometimes there's a, a, a sign still like very dangerous. Don't go after the fence because after the fence, you know, there's still some some places that are kind of like. Uh, museum fields you know mm. where there's still some trenches and stuff and then there's a behind the fence they put a plate uh, warning people to not go over it because there's still some uh, some uh, some un, uh, un uncleaned um, yeah, some life rounds in the ground life rounds etc yeah. so um, but it's yeah, it's also a way to keep the people on the path you know? Yeah, maybe to add to the experience. Because if you, Even if, exactly uh, to yeah. add to the to to the to the to romance of uh, of the of the setting, you know, for tourists. Exactly. But I'm yeah. I'm not a tourist. You know, I'm like a, I'm an uh, an active citizen. Yeah, but the, the the anarchy kind of aspect of this story, mm -hmm. what you were talking about before, when you do graffiti, you don't go and ask permission from the city. Can I graffiti this wall or no. this electrical? Um, main switch that's you know house in this metal shack yeah. you you go out at night i assume or you do it during the day as well yeah yeah it's better in the day <laughs> really People don't expect it i'm now a, a man of age i'm 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 becoming 55 this year so yeah a 50 year old guy with a normal outfit and stuff they don't with a long jacket or something they don't expect him to be a graffiti guy they expect him to be the undercover cop. Mm. So that's my best uh, undercover cloak, you know? That's what you say when you get you get the police come by and they say, well, what the fuck are you doing? It's like, well, yeah, yeah, no, they look at me, I look at them back, I, I say hello, they say hello. <laughs> and, but yeah, you just don't get caught. That's the, that's the trick, you know? But did you ever get caught? Yes, I, I've, I've been caught once in a while, but not uh, too dramatic. And uh, I'm, I'm most of the time I managed to talk my way out of it yeah <laughs> you're a good talker uh, well, no but i mean uh, can i can imagine when you go go abroad let's say you go to germany or you go to yeah. france and you start running a circle in a place you're not supposed to be or you know you don't have yeah. permission to be at i can imagine that the way how people behave in countries outside of the netherlands even within the netherlands when you meet a cop the cop is usually like yeah i kind of understand why you're doing this but can you please not do it and in germany you know uh, me and my brother last week were in Dusseldorf and uh, um, trying to um, find some abandoned buildings. Mm -hmm. And within five minutes, there was security guards standing yep. next to us. And they, it was immediately like cops and, and all this stuff. You know, everything uh, is like, um, it's a language, you know? So like every country speaks its own language. And then in the city... Or in the different uh, countries, there's subdivisions and, 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 and different provinces with their own dialects or uh, different villages, etc. And it's the art of speaking the or understanding the language as good as possible. And not literally, but in the sense of the code, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know. And sometimes you can 
pretend to be tourists and then you can act clumsy, like to over exaggerate the fact that you don't speak the language. And then they could go like, okay, it's too complicated. So yeah, I was in France and then I start to talk in Dutch. So they like, you know, <laughs> then it becomes really exotic for them and they panic and they, okay, forget about it. But that doesn't work in Germany. So then you have to have another approach. And so it depends on what you do or how you want to maneuver through the, um, through the city, let's say, and, and what you do as well. So what's, what's the approach in Germany? How, you, how would you do this? Well, it depends, it depends what you do, you know, but trespassing, like urban exploration, yeah, you, you really need to uh, um, do a, a good estimation of the location that you want to visit. You know, if, it's, if you are the first one to go, then it's tricky that they might uh, catch, if they catch you, that uh, that you're uh, like breaking in. You know? uh, yeah, but if yeah. there's already a lot of graffiti, et cetera, then you can always, you know, use that as an excuse. Like, oh yeah, but uh. so it, it I'm depends. Here, I'm here to observe the graffiti. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Like I'm a photographer, ah, yeah. and I'm making a book about uh, German graffiti or, or like the architectural heritage. You know, you don't talk about graffiti, but about the architecture that you're uh, interested in the architecture of the old East German. Uh, factories or whatever you know so it, it but it really depends on um who you have in front yeah you know and uh i got caught in uh, in belgium like uh, uh, uh like uh, two weeks ago like one and a half week ago by uh, i mean it's harvest time now and uh, they're harvesting the grain and i was running uh, a circle in the grain field next to um an honor field, how do you call this? Like a, a graveyard. Oh, yeah. Where yeah, they yeah. Uh, buried a lot of um, uh, English soldiers that, that fell in the First World War. And uh, like you have uh, like the English, they had this policy like, okay, where the, 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 the soldiers died, that's where they will be buried. So in the field that they are, they, they collect all the remains and they put it there mm. in, a, in a small corner. So everywhere in Belgium and France where it was fought, you have all the small islands of, of graves and uh, so this was a very uh, beautiful setting next to um, next to a train track next to the grain field uh, in between those two and um, and it was really like far away from the village and uh, and it was only like uh, I think like a kilometer further there was another grain field and they were harvesting there but not yet next to the the, the, the field that I was, thought was interesting so I made my circle there in the grain, it goes really fast. You run like two, three times circle. Then already you have a path, and uh, but you do a preparation. It's like like half an hour work. Then you run for half an hour, so it's like one hour, and then you you get the drone out, etc. You 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 kind of choose the the position that you want to uh, film from, and then it's uh, action. But it it means that you are like for three quarters, one hour in the field, nonetheless, yeah. even. Yeah with a quick uh, thing and then um at a certain time i was um i was running filming running filming i ran out of battery another battery etc and then i was sitting just behind um, the the wall of the the graveyard and then above me was on the graveyard itself was was the farmer and kind of pissed off like yeah what are you doing in my, in my field it's money <laughs> and uh, so it became a big story but I run in this crop field and there's a, there were really a lot of tracks, you know, like the, the, the farmer goes there to spray all the poison, et, et cetera, you know, and uh, so they, they flatten the field and the, 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 the tractor tracks are much wider than the track I make while running. But from the angle, I was realizing from the angle where she was standing, she couldn't see the tracks that I was making. So, but she saw that I was uh, controlling my drone. So she, I think she saw me before in the field, but she, I, I guessed that she didn't know what I was actually doing. Yeah. So in a split second, I tried to, to see where I can get the angle out of the, of the situation. So in this case, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I started to blah, blah, blah my way out. Like I, I, told them that I was interested in the historical landscapes. 
I was a photographer and I'm doing a study with my drone. So it's three bullshit points. Uh -huh. And then somewhere I see the response and then try to build a conversation. And this is what happened. And then she kind of loosened up and then she started to talk for three quarters of an hour about the, 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 grand, the, the, the great war and about her grandparents, about the war that they had to leave in 1914 and they were refugees for seven years and blah 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 all this kind of stuff but also in that story she gave me a lot of context about that field that yeah. was her, her family field already for like uh, five or six generations and also from the first world war that the whole field was a graveyard that everywhere where there was now crops and where i was running in fact it was a graveyard and there were trenches there, etc., and then they got all the, the the remains all together, and they put that on this temporary uh, or this 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 uh, this small uh, improvisory uh, graveyard. Yeah. So it it was like in the end, of course, the first stress is like, oh fuck, maybe <laughs> she's gonna call the cops, and it becomes complicated, and uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I lose time, especially. Yeah. You know. And no, but at the same time, you know. It, it, the way that you tell it right now, it's almost desirable to get caught because of the information that you get that adds to the story of the work that you just made. So in a way, it's almost like yeah, maybe it's good to get caught. Well, um, it's good to get in a conversation, but getting caught is is a, it's a is a kind of a, a, a tricky path. You know, you can also go to the lo local bar and start talking about. Uh, about the fields, for example, then you can also get its information. But in my case, my aim is to make that drawing in that setting and the confrontation that comes out of it, um, for me, adds to the to the flavor of doing, because I, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm, if, if I don't get in trouble, I'm really happy, you know, because it gives me really uh, interesting um, uh, uh, information in depth of the place. Yeah. But um, that I wouldn't have gotten other ways, you know. And uh, but nine out of ten times it doesn't work like that, you know. So I do my pre-study, I just make my drawing, and then I go home, and it works or it doesn't work, you know. And and the stories, the majority of the stories, um, I um, I just found out on the spot, you know. But the the the. Yeah, the, most of the time, if I get in trouble, like confrontations with with people or police or other stuff, it's like um, it's it's interfering in the pleasure of the work. Really? Yeah. Oh. No, or it's like it's like uh, too overwhelming, you know, because it costs a lot. You're you're concentrated. You want to make a drawing, you know, like a white paper. You do a thing, so it gets you out of the concentration and it adds something. It's it's you know it's a bit distracting, but that almost sounds like the because um, the way how you now describe making. If the you want to do graffiti, you don't want you do you don't do graffiti f for being caught. No, you know? no, okay, and I understand that. But at the same time, graffiti maybe because of graffiti has this nature of being highly illegal and and demolishing something much more than when you go in a field and you run a circle. Yeah, for a farmer, maybe this is, you know, you're breaking down the crops, it costs them money, etc., etc. But at the same time, uh, uh, to me, it doesn't feel that that negative. It doesn't really seem to have that negative connotation that graffiti seems to have. No, it doesn't. No, no, that's that's the, the camouflage, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm not in it for the for the causing damage, breaking things, etc. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm in it for... And that was also with with the, the graffiti things that I uh, used to do and and still sometimes do. It's about like uh, you break in into a, the fabric of a certain code, you know, of how certain things go in in the public space, and 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 you want to contribute to a discussion about the um, the, uh, the certain codes that are there, you know, and. Either uh, if if you spray paint some some whatever stupid smiley on a billboard uh, where they advertise with a sixteen year old girl in a bikini some some fashion thing, which is completely stupid, and or 
I run into a, uh, I run in, in uh, on an abandoned uh, factory on the roof of an abandoned factory. Yeah, it's my own risk. I leave my traces there. I document it, and it and it gets after that. I try to get it a second life, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, as a tribute to that space, a tribute to, yeah, the the kind of the 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 thinking that I believe in, you know, about about the freedom of movement or the the freedom of expression or you know how cities should be in my definition. But when you're talking about cities, cities are the collection of people. Uh, defining an area and having their own culture and architectural way of living um, that confrontation that you get with people when you get caught in a way it depends you, you need to have a specific skill set as well to deal with that and do you think mm -hmm. that that makes that brings that relationship of dealing with people to places like for example a field of weed or all of a sudden you, you stand in front of a farmer that really wants to share their story Hmm. Well, I mean, you know, there's a confrontation. You know, I'm a I'm a professional in thinking about the city mm -hmm. and intervening into that structure in how I define it and playing with it, and it generates some language that I share. And it, but it's uh, it's like it's uh, it's um, it's complicated to explain this to the, to a, an angry farmer. Mm -hmm. you know when when i break in into his fabric and he's kind of the victim of it but once i understand that he understands that he's open enough in in the conversation i start to explain about certain things and like how from my city point of view uh, the field uh, the, uh, the the farm field is in relation to the tourism just around the corner where there's the war monuments etc yeah. and all this and and and, and then uh, it might uh, occur that the farmer says, oh, this is really interesting. And, uh, and then we share uh, emails and stuff. I send him the picture. It's like, wow, this is great. You know, I had this a couple of times. It's really nice, you know. And still, he doesn't know what to do with it. And I don't know what to do with it, except for the fact that it's art, so it's useless anyway, but it's a tool to reflect. But isn't yeah. isn't that the thing? Isn't that the way of how you get art to people in a very direct way? Yeah. Whereas if you show them, if you just put the picture yeah. in the gallery, then you need people to come to the gallery and they have yeah. to invest and, and spend time and start looking yeah. at it. Whereas the farmer has, you know, you bring something into a, a, a fabric, I like this uh, definition, or, or a, um, a code, uh, and you kind of make alterations just so they can they can view when you live in a beautiful place mm -hmm. you don't see it's beautiful anymore because you see it every day mm -hmm. but the tourists come and they say oh it's fantastic mm -hmm. this is where Anne Frank used to live you know she's not home but you can check out the house and then um, uh, when you live in Amsterdam you go by this place every day you don't see the, yeah. the beauty of it and maybe this is the way of how yeah it's a one on one interaction and I can understand when you make this work it's an intervention in your process, but at the same time, I think there's a very high value in the in the interaction that is. Yeah, yeah there is, there is. Of course, it's like you know, every destabilization, let's say, uh, has, has an effect of that people have to refine their spot, you know, reflect and and kind of recalibrate. And uh, and once my intervention and I get. Uh, in, in contact with people uh, in, 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 in conversation and they are willing to, to, to listen to why I do certain things and how I see it and how I see certain parameters and, and try to manage that they follow my thought, yeah, then it's very uh, valuable, you know, like, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's the pleasure of doing art in public space, you know, like if I put a sticker uh, or I put like 5,000 stickers, you know, with one sticker, nothing happens. But with 5,000 stickers, there's there's many potential encounters that a lot of people have. I will get the feedback uh, back somehow, or people start to do their own stickers and they start sticking it over mine and stuff like that. There's many ways, if you do something in public space, there's many ways of 
reading of fi- making um, sub conclusions. You know, that's really fantastic, and uh, yeah, and that's different than when you make a painting and you hang it in a in a, in a classical gallery and then you wait for the reviews to appear or something like that. You know? Well, maybe, but at the same time, I can imagine that that process of making sub conclusions can take place while painting, mm. for example, a series, or is Absolutely. it you're drawing sub conclusions based on? S- uh, several works in a yeah. certain theme or like you yeah now you yeah. went to france and belgium yeah you worked with environments that were highly um shaped by this this world war one environment yeah um uh that seems to me lo- almost like a series of work yeah i mean it's you know since since corona time it's like two and a half years now like almost three years ago uh two years ago um uh, I started doing this this circles and um, all came together and I, I decided okay I'm just gonna run circles that's it you know and it's like uh, no matter what shapes you can do the circle is like it's basic it's most difficult and uh, and it became kind of like a tool like I can do what I want you know I have like I'm capable to run around the world if I want to you know I, I'm now aware that the body can do this you know and the body can recover along the way and it's just a mental thing and I thought okay um, in that sense let's just keep doing circles in that case because I can throw in a cube once in a while or a triangle or whatever another shape but it doesn't change anything so anything so much you know the only thing that really matters is the context um of that specific um intervention and uh so i did um for like one and a half years more or less i started to become more specific in the the spots that i was uh, choosing and uh so i was like right now i was like i was on a path like a half year ago where i decided to do uh, just some infrastructure things like trying to come very close to the motorways and then, like in between some crossings and and, and intervention and intersections, you have some green in between, kind of lost parks, you know, where nobody comes, not even a rabbit. And trying to get there and run it, and then to see and to film it as well. And there's a couple of layers. Like it's great to break in into that structure that is just infrastructure mm-hmm. in, with capitals, governmental landscape thing, etc. Uh, so it's really no go. So if you want to to walk there or run there, you need to have like the the whole yellow outfit and all that kind of stuff, like the fluo uh, suit, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then walking there, running there, it's super weird because the the everybody sees you, but everybody sees you hundred kilometers per hour in a flash, in a in a split. So in this split second, because of the outfit, they think. Of, Oh yeah, okay. He's working there. It's okay. Most of the time, not always. So you have to find a way that you can get away with it, mm-hmm, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, or you choose the time when it's like around five o'clock, six, six o'clock in the evenings when it's the the traffic jam and then people are too busy. Or you do it like in another time when there's hardly any traffic. So it's 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 a kind of a puzzle. And so I I decided to to see if I could find different spots and to make a series out of it. So instead of doing an individual circle and another video with another individual circle and another and another, I decided to make kind of theme uh, series with infrastructure, with motorway stuff, and with other uh, like factory things, roof things, etc. cetera. And, uh, but it's, it's quite um, a, a long way to, to, to gather those spots. To have the the right uh, timing as well, and um, yeah, and then the Ukrainian, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine started, and uh, it quite uh, impacted uh, the mind for me. And I wanted to do kind of um, after some thinking, I wanted to do some uh, yeah to add the war into the location, you know, and um, and then looking around here there was not so much of this kind of uh, reflections of course in the netherlands i found like landscapes uh, that were like from the like like 
painted by war from the 17th century. And this kind of intrigued me, you know, this kind of weird time traveling things that it was mm -hmm. always that the war, of course, it's always there. We are all against war, but already it's there for 10,000 years and, and it's going to be there for another two, three, four thousand years until we are really eradicated, you know. And Do you think that's going to be the, the end? It's not war that will be the end. War is just our natural way of, you know, if we are with too much people, like you have like the, the Feyenoord people and the Ajax people, you put them together and you get war. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Or this is like for some reason how, how society pushes itself every time. But you, but, but you think enough. that that 5,000 years, that's when the end will take place? Or oh, like, well, I but, think but you sooner. think eradication is, is, is at some point it will happen for human beings? Well, the end of the world, you know, it becomes too hot and too dry and there will be no more food, you know? There's already plastic everywhere. We know yeah. this, you know. It's the end of the world. At least for people, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I don't know how long this is going to take. If it's like two, three, four, five generations. But, yeah, it's going to be uh, like a, a dramatic implosion, you know. But what, what, why was it so important for you to add the war as a theme in your work? Because you could also say that, well, you know, it takes place. But because it's such a political movement and almost like a populist thing to to focus on uh because it's like standing on the highway with a rose for ms 17 mm -hmm. you know like everyone does it so i'm not gonna be bothered with this i'm just gonna do my own thing and then you know uh, why was it so important for you to add this theme to your work i think um um in everything i do there is a an underline of uh Kind of like a, how do you how do you say this in English? And um, I'm an engaged artist, you know, like a political aware, socially aware. Uh, you know, the, the society is going through the veins of the stuff I do. You don't see this all the time, but I thought it was really relevant to kind of um, make it more visible. You know, like I I did a couple of. Um, uh, exhibitions with this uh, running circles and the decor of the videos were um, big banners with political um, statements or that mm -hmm. this is how it looked. They were quotes from uh, news articles and they were taken from different, from the Guardian, from the BBC.com from CNN, whatever, New York Times, Washington Post, you name it. Um, international things, The Spiegel, uh, Le Monde. And um, I took the quotes from articles that showed what that I woke up with in the morning with uh, getting my news feeds from my Facebook and social media things, etc. Reading the world and uh, the articles... I started my day with, um, and the most intriguing, weird themes, uh, and then the crossing sentences I collected. So articles about the, the melting of the ice caps, the, 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 the pollution, the, the plastic being everywhere, you know, uh, you name it, you know, like refugees, um, uh, moving from one place to another because there it's uninhabitable already and so they move to the west how did the west deals with it the racism all that kind of, all the all the big themes that um uh, are choking me in the, in the morning already but are really relevant i didn't want to ignore them i want to make them part of my work yeah you know they always are indirect but i want them to be more direct in the work but without being dogmatic but when you when you do your banners, because you also do mm -hmm. spray painted texts or yeah. like place banners somewhere yeah. in the city, yeah. they always have these quotes that are quite um, uh, polarized. For example, I remember some of them were really st uh, specifically about artists. Um, yeah. You know, like why don't you get a real job? This kind of stuff. Yeah, that's uh, it's an older series, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I mean, yeah, but yeah. it's it's still yeah. part of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. that yeah. way of taking the news and implementing it into your yeah. work. Yeah. But then doing it, uh, but that's quite. Yeah, you know, in your face and on the surface. Yeah. But when you go running in a field that was used, 
you know, as a battlefield in the First World War, yeah. all of a sudden it becomes, you know, even if you don't know, there might be lines in there that look like trenches. So you were talking yeah. about this before, that when, yeah. um, when the humidity of the, when it gets really hot, you can see the lines in the, in the, of the trenches still in the field. Yeah, I, I think you always do, you know, it depends on, you know, like now I, I was in France and they just uh, cut the weed and they uh, get the hay away in the big bowls and then they took it off the field like two days ago and yesterday they plowed the field and then it's kind of like neutralized again and I took my drone there this morning and from above you still see the traces where exactly like, pretty much uh, accurately like you can see the lines of the, the trenches from uh, 1914 till 1918 and um and it's really amazing like how precise it still is. And I don't know, because I think in that part, it's because the underlayer is like uh, some calcare kind of surface. So they dug it up by uh, while digging the trenches, like uh, three meter deep trenches, two meter deep trenches. So they dug up the white stuff and brought it up, mm. put it on the sides. So they had their inway. And of course then, there's also a change of, of waterways. Like in the trench, it's more water than in the field or the other way around. I don't know. But there's, so it kind of, the, the difference in the field was conserved after 100 years. So if you fly over, if you check on Google Earth, um, you, you can see certain spots where you really have the, the, the traces of the history really... Um, being drawn let's say so um and on that specific spot it was the on the first of july uh 1916 when the english decided to do the big campaign and on that specific spot like thousands of men died and um so it's a really like a it's like the the the, the epiphany of the 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 first world war is there on that spot you know and uh, so i i went there today ran my circle there a couple of times until there was a really uh, good enough drawing and uh, and then I documented it. I haven't seen the material yet. I, I'm going to check it tomorrow. But it, it was really fascinating because you, it, of course, it's an inter intervening, an intervention into that setting. Nobody knows because the farmer doesn't give a shit. The people that drive around, the tourists, they have the monuments, etc. cetera. Yep. So, you know, if I would publish this, everybody in France would be really like uh, super angry, like, oh, it's like res disrespectful, etc. And the whole circus starts. But if they don't know, they would never mind, would never bother. Yeah. So there's, I, this is also an aspect that I'm really interested about. You know, as, a, uh, as I said, like as a vandalist, if you say you're a vandalist, people are shocked. If you say you're a graffiti writer, ah, yeah, yeah, street art, Banksy, it's okay. You know, but if you say that you're a vandalist, it means that you break into a structure and people start to become protective of that structure, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I think as an artist, we have a role to play that you have to challenge that structures all the time. Yeah. So by definition, you need to break in, you know? You, you were talking about you're a city structure person going to the countryside structure and break in, add or challenge it. Mm -hmm. But uh, were, you, were you born in the city yourself or where did you... Because I, I remember you were talking one time about uh, uh, Suriname. Yeah, I, I, was, uh, I was born in, uh, in the city. But on my fifth... Uh, my parents took me to Suriname, which was a, a, a colony of the Netherlands in that time in South America. And uh, my father worked for the for the Dutch government in that time, so he took his family there. And uh, and then at a certain time, the country became independent, and then we moved back to the Netherlands again. And the period I stayed in Suriname was between my fifth and my. 11th more or less mm -hmm. so it was the lager um, school like the, the, the uh, elementary school elementary right. school right. so 
at the end of the elementary school, I came back to the Netherlands and and I was kind of surprised to see I, I moved temporary. My parents moved into the sur- this new suburbs from the late 70s. And I was really intrigued. Like, you know, I came from Suriname, like it's the Amazon, you know, like the, the forest and parrots and the noise of the wood, etc. And, you know, like the, the aggression of the wild, of the nature and, 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 you know, this kind of stuff. Because the Suriname is five times as big as the Netherlands. Yeah. They have 500,000 people, 600,000 No, not even in that time. I think it was like 200,000. Wow. And, and, and the capital, uh, which is the only city, had, I think, in that time, like 50,000 people or something. Wow. And the other, or like, I, I think, like, after the independence, there were as much people from Suriname living in the Netherlands as in as in Suriname or in Paramaribo, the capital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it was really like I mean, it's it's a it's an, it's a very fast country, and it's not very uh, crowded, you know. And but I came here and I I was I was implemented in this uh, suburbia setting, this typical new suburb from the seventies. Uh, kind of this Alex von Warmerdam kind of vibe. Yeah, kind of, you know. And I was surprised by. You know, in parks, there were like three types of trees that were planted there, five types of pl- uh, of bushes. One type grass. of duck. That's it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, one the ducks and, and, and the house cat and the dog shitting on the football field. And that was it, you know. And I was really like, um, I don't know, like I, I was like uh, uh, triggered, you know, slowly. And so... Once I stumbled into art school, I kind of like, I realized like, wow, this is really like fascinating material to think about the city. I love the city. I I don't want to be again back into a kind of small town kind of setting like how Paramaribo was or the city I, I, was, I was brought back into by, by my parents after. You know, I, I like the big city thing because it's also a kind of like um it gives you an insight in the future you know if you're curious about how it will be in 100 years you shouldn't be living in a small town you need to live in the biggest city of the world you know you left to live in whatever in in beijing or tokyo or something like that you know that gives you the insight of the the dystopian future that is waiting for us you know <laughs> well i mean if, if everyone or it's, it's such large amounts of people are going to die because of food shortage and and you know uh, we're gonna lose a lot of land due to rising water levels. Maybe we'll get to the point where the big cities are fifty thousand people. You never know. You know, maybe the yeah. countryside is the future. Sure, uh, sure. You know, yeah. No, no, of course. You know, like I mean, we can, we can talk about the the sketches of the future, like how society will collapse and everything. But I think, like, uh, yeah. It's complicated. I mean, that that's really looking into the glass bowl. You know? Yeah, of like, course. No, no. But but I mean, I'm I'm not asking you for what no, what it will be like. But um, I can imagine that saying that going to Tokyo and saying, well, Tokyo is the future, or you know, New York is the future. But look at New York after COVID. How yeah. many people left, and how many businesses left, and really the bustling, hustling, vibrant city New York used to be. Yeah, is no longer the same as three years ago. No, but the normal people, the poor people, they have to stay. Yeah. You know, like my kind of people, you know, they're the normal people that need to survive in Tokyo or in Rotterdam or in whatever, any city, you know. Of course, the rich people, they are privileged enough to move to to, to places, whatever, their bunker in a small uh, um, island in the, in the Caribbean or something like that, you know, that they bought privately. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, and, you know, in one generation, it's not going to collapse, but I have two children. And of course, then you reflect more about this kind of things like, okay, how will life be in a hundred years? You know, like mm-hmm. the the first world war, going back to this uh, war stories, for example, it gives you also like, okay, I'm, I'm intrigued yeah, to say the least um, about uh, what happened with the, uh, Iraq, um, of the 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 Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine, 
like uh, two months, what now? But already like uh, four months ago. Yeah, yeah, it goes faster. Yeah. <laughs> March, April, May. Yeah, it's like five months ago. Jesus. And uh, you know, like like that. These wars uh, and the impact of it, it's like it's everlasting. You know, like the war from you know our i mean the the second world war of course uh, infected or impacted and infected a lot uh, the netherlands but before that like the you know like the 80 years war with spain for example but still we have traces of that you know mm -hmm. like the division between the north of the netherlands and the south the brab like the, the the catholics and the protestants all this kind of stuff it's still there you know yeah Yeah, no, I could imagine that for in one way or another. Or in Ireland, you know, it's like the the, the leftovers from that, you know, mm -hmm. the, the drama of North Ireland. Yeah, and that is still not solved yeah. because, well, very often you get the feeling that because of the polarization that takes place nowadays uh, politically, uh, that at some point um, the IRA or, or something yeah. like that might get more support or might flare up again, and people might get the idea that violence might be a solution out of the problems that they're facing or that they're imagining because a lot of the trouble that seems to take place yeah i mean it, from there's, there's not going to be a, a solution coming out of violence you know but 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 nonetheless the impact that remains um yeah is super tragic yeah. you know like and, and like yeah like in 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 the netherlands You know the division between the the, the Spanish and the, and the, the Protestant kind of uh, division. You know it's it's drawn into the landscape also, like physically. You know you can still see the remains of the battles and the, the borders that that were shifting. You know, and it's the same with with the the the, the First World War. You know, and the, the movement of the borders that the Germans moved uh, westward and and then got pushed back again at a certain time but after like a four year drama you know with all the consequences of all the million deaths like one and a half million died in 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 um, in a handful of years you know yeah yeah no we're looking at the the difference if, even still now looking at the difference between the west and the east in the netherlands we have these farmers protests nowadays in, yep. in the netherlands where uh, Farmers take to the highway and they burn down tires and, and yeah, I missed that bit, but uh, I saw it uh, last week. Yeah, yeah. In the news a little bit. Yeah, yeah so uh, this yeah. seems to 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 give this feeling, at least to me. I I come from the east. Uh, I'm in the east very often of the Netherlands. I'm super annoyed by all these Dutch flags upside down in the <laughs> Netherlands everywhere. And the thing is, what nobody really realizes, and I think that's really the point of it. The world goes to shit because of the power of corporations. That's already for a hundred years or 150 years. Mm. Corporations build their power through legal ways, with lawyers, etc. Uh, create precedences in 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 legal cases with judges. Even they pay the judges or not. If not now, then at least 80 years, 100 years ago. And in their way define their power that is completely overwhelming uh, civilian uh, interest mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and what happened like the world goes now with the environment you name it with all kinds of ways it's all about uh, corporate power and uh, I think the, the problem with, with the farmers now is that the farmers are all also pushed into fields the last 20 years that they didn't want to be in but it's the agricultural industries and the banks like the Rabobank whatever they push them into becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and now they're fucked you know mm -hmm. and now you know the, the society needs them to to adjust because of env environmental limitations and they cannot anymore and the banks and the corporations they are untouchable they are outside of the the, no. the image And still, they push, I mean, not the banks, but the agricultural uh, lobbies, they push underneath the carpet, they push the, the farmer's angriness, you know? And that's Yeah, at the same amazing. time, uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, yes, but at the same time, uh, looking at how uh, the bank 
has these farmers in their grasp, even if they're being mm. bought out, the money will go to pay off the loans that they took out to Absolutely. do the job. Yeah. So the money will go straight into the banks. Yeah. So, it, I mean, the farmers don't really get a benefit out of getting uh, a good price for the land, really. No, no. no. No, and they are fucked. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And yeah. with that goes, and I think that's the anger of the farmer in general, with that comes uh, a frustration um, uh, concerning the, the way of life and the culture that they have to give up when they stop being farmers. Yeah, but they're, they're angry. Their anger is pushed and framed by other people for them, and they follow that. And it's aimed at the wrong corner. It's aimed at the vegetarian, the Groen Links, or whatever. This kind of bullshit themes. Not, I mean, they have to look around. Like, why do I need, like, instead of like a stable with uh, fifty pigs, why do I need five thousand? You know, or mm, whatever. Mm, mm. You know, and what happened? I mean, they romanticized, like. The, you know, where their grandfather was and their father now is and where they are now and that it becomes like, it became a kind of a monster factory, you know? And and why this is, I mean, this is not questioned, you know, out loud, at least not by themselves. No, but I think the, the, the problem is, is they respond out of emotion. They, they are being told that they can't continue to be farmers. They're told that, you know, you have to give up your... Your uh, your way your way of life, and uh, I think this is the the way the reason why they put all the flags upside down as well. Of course, it's to use the symbol of you know uh, a tragic moment, uh, putting the flag upside down. But at the same time, um, they want to have a symbol for themselves to unify before behind. The same way as they have a culture or a fabric. What you were talking about before. It's all marketing, you know, like the they have also this uh, the the yeah, yeah. the the, the handkerchief, the handkerchief, yeah. the farmer handkerchief, this kind of carnival thing, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like kind of it's but it's like kind of a cliche that they push over the top, and it's like um, it's marketing. It's like the, the this political uh, party uh, now, this this Boerenpartij thing. She yeah. is a marketing person, you know. Yeah, but at the same time, it, it, this is you were talking before about how the world's been shaped by corporations, mm -hmm. how corporations define the yeah. structure of society, yeah, and they also define the structure of thinking. Yeah. So absolutely. marketing, every you're an artist, yeah. you know, you need to market. Yeah. You, know, you know, you need to push yeah. certain information across the internet mm -hmm. or among your friends to get people to come to your shows. Like, if yeah. you don't do it, you know, yeah. either you feel bad about it or you're being told off, like, hey, maybe you should make some posts about this, you know, because uh, get some more people to go and watch out your show. But if you don't do it, then you miss no, out but the, the... I used to, be, before I went to art school, I used to have a, like a Blue Monday, I was at a graphic advertising school. And I worked for an advertising company for like a summer holiday job and I did some, you know, some, some silk screen company things and all that kind of stuff. So I was like in the in this little angle of advertising and I, I got it taught at school also for one year and I was really intrigued but also annoyed by it that it was in the end, it was just about manipulation and to, to have the skill of the language of like the of visual language and then use it or abuse it into getting the money out of the wallet of people. Yeah. And when I went to art school, it's similar uh, myth, method, methodology, uh, methodology, methodology. Um, <laughs> um, but the aim is different. It's not about, in the end, getting the wallet out of, uh, you know, shaking the wallet upside down of your audience, but it's getting the message across. Yeah. And it's, in my case, it's a message about, it's it's about, you know, like the question of what art is in society, the importance of poetry and anarchy and Ill illogical, illogicality. Jesus. Uh, well, anyway, complicated words. But... Uh, that it's like the right to be illogical, you know, and um, these are things that are, uh, by definition, inefficient, you know, and contra-economic, yeah. you know, and that is the point, that is the position 
that I want to claim for art. But at the same time, the artist has been pushed more and more towards being an entrepreneur throughout the years. Yeah, but that's a, that's a game that you can follow or not. You know, in the end, of course, you know, if you need to pay because you cannot squat, you need to pay rent, and the rent becomes like from fifty euros to a hundred euros to five hundred euros to a thousand euros a month. You know, of course, then you need to to think about like how you can maintain the, the economy of your practice. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that you are an entrepreneur as such, like uh, that you can compete with companies. It's like a, it's like a bogus competition. No. I mean, of course, it's about survival, but it's a survival on behalf of the message, the message of the independence of art, of, of the independence of people. Mm-hmm. So think. would you say that when you, uh, when you have grants from the government... Where nowadays, if you're, we just started a, f- a foundation a few years, a year ago, half a year ago, mm. me and my brother, and uh, and we are looking at these government grants to set up some projects. Yeah. Um, and when we get this money, we need to subscribe to certain clauses, yeah. certain clauses. Yeah. Uh, but they are very highly politicized clauses, whereas this money is meant for cultural or art endeavors. Yeah. Um, so that already taints colors the kind of stuff that you're gonna do or how you're gonna do it yeah but it's 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 lingo you know it's it gives you more the insight of the pressure that's that the subsidy giver like the mondrian foundation or the local cbks or whatever Mm -hmm. the pressure that they feel from the political parties but they are a buffer they are a filter to um to keep to try to defend the freedom of art, of artist positions, and I mean it depends, you know, like if you apply for uh, money with uh, with uh, fr- from the province, it's different than from cities. Yeah. Or it's different than from national things, from the the Prince Bernard Fonds or something like that. But always the aim of the foundation is the independence of the art product. Of course, yeah. And but the lingo is you feel the pressure of the fact that they are feeling being watched by right wing government, right wing political uh, parties. You know, they are afraid of being framed by that they are like you give money away to lazy people, this kind of cliches, you know. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. but so it's, I think it's just a game to. To manage the language, to manage the dialect, and but still to do the same thing, you know. I mean, the importance of art is uh, you and me as artists are the ones to protect that, not yeah. the sub- subsidy giver. No, but they're the ones who uh, are. Uh, let's look at the overhead mm-hmm. of the cultural sector. That's where the majority of the money goes, and um, the management, the curators, the museums, yeah. uh, the yeah. presentation. Uh, Institutes the yeah, podium, all the filter people. Yeah, the yeah. The, the, the the cleaning staff and the and the yeah. bar staff yeah. get paid first, and yeah. then let's see if there's some money for the artist. Yeah. Um, to put the pressure of, of protecting culture yeah. in a broad sense on the on the on the shoulders of the artists, and to have them do it pro bono, and to also s- schedule to 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 form to shape the academies in such a way yeah. that they're not prepared to do this kind of sounds like a futile position to be in because now you're responsible for something you don't even really understand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's, you know, you should how I see it is like you should see it as a game, you know, and that it's like how you can can manage to find your money while or and still do your own thing. That's it, you know. No matter what, you cannot compromise. So how do you get your money? If you cannot get it anymore from this kind of funds, you need to get it from other funds or to get yeah. some private sponsors or whatever, mm-hmm. you know. And so, and then they become obsolete because they. Uh, but, but you, but you also understand that for many people, the yeah. the, the temptation to lie is quite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you know. Yeah, that's the that's the tragedy they fall in, you know. But it doesn't generate good art. No. If it does generate good art, well, whatever, good for them. But if, but 
for me, I, I just do what I do, you know? Yeah, yeah. You, you said you had two kids. Yeah. What is it like to, because you're quite a risk taker, you're running around in fields with un, un, undetonated <laughs> mortars mines and, and mines. bombs and hand grenades. What is it like to... to, to uh, I do this on holidays only. Oh, when okay. they are not around, <laughs> when they are around, I'm a very responsible father. You give the and, the, uh, the right uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and example. They and they don't know. No, no. Hey, I have, I have one question. Yeah. Um, do you have a toilet on board? Um, well, I have a sink. Okay, and then I piss overboard. Yeah. No, no, but not allowed. We're not allowed to do that. But you can piss in the sink. Sanitary pause. <sighs> Yeah, it smells salty. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, don't worry um, about it. Uh, yeah. uh, parenthood and art. Yeah, parenthood and art. That's that's. Uh, yeah, that's it's interesting. Uh, it's a it's a dilemma, you know. It's a minefield. You're um, you're dancing on a little bit because, because yeah. Uh, well, you know, um, by the time your your kids get. Um, get older i have like um one that is 12 years old and one son that is 16 now and they uh, they become more independent now more um, aware and more towards adulthood and um, more self um, exploring you know and uh, and also like slowly the the city becomes bigger around them, you know, or their world uh, expands around them. Oh, and, yeah. and that's, it's very fascinating. It's also interesting that I have to, um, have to be aware, of course, as uh, of my role as a parent in that, you know, I have to redefine myself all the time. You know, when you have a five-year-old, it's very easy to be a parent. You know, you just play, you throw a ball and you dance around and you, invite some kids and you know you tell them to not come too close to the fire and you know this kind of stuff or how to make fire and but by the time they get older um different kind of um elements come into play for them like whatever like uh disputes or the threat of big city life in different ways and uh and then you also have to Oh, buddy. Cool. <laughs> we gotta, we gotta get sitting it. in a boat, <laughs> on the water, in the middle of nowhere on the sea, and I think we just passed by an island. Yeah, no, I, I instant thing I think about is copyright strikes, <laughs> authorship. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, <Very> nice. <laughs> no, but it's, it's fascinating. You know, I, I, I made a choice. To do, don't do too much um, compromise in my art. Mm. Of course, I don't want to fall off uh, the side of a roof of a building or something like that, or trap on a mine, or step on a mine and it explodes, whatever. But that was not different 15 years ago before I had kids, or 16 years ago. No, because you still be, you know, in the hospital or. I don't want to uh, die. I don't want to be crippled. I want to be. Uh, very efficient until deep in my 80s, you know? And uh, as an artist, this is my joy. This is my uh, way to reflect as a person as well, you know? It's my, my, my filter, my sunglasses to, to, uh, to be able to deal with the world. And, uh, and also as a parent, you know, to kind of think about what could, besides my position in the world, also, what is then the position of my kids in the world? Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting thing, you know. But yeah, of course, I became a little bit more careful along the way. But as an artist, you're anonymous, or anonymous, autonomous in mm -hmm. your practice. Um, well, how do you deal with yeah. how do you deal with the autonomy of your your own children? Because can you tell them like, no, don't do that. But dad, you know, you go out and do graffiti yourself all the time. Uh, how yeah, do you do I, it? I did, I did this, these kind of things knowing that it was illegal. If it was not illegal, I would have found other things to find. I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by 
um, doing this kind of um, taking these kind of positions because it it's how the society manifests itself towards me. Oh. You know, if I'm on the edge, this is like the difference between problems or not, you know, or death or not, or whatever, you know. And uh, if you could paint every object that you could, then I would have done something else. Yeah, but that's as a parent, the things that you run into. That's why I, I don't, hear often. I don't forbid them things, you know. I really, 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 really intensely advise them not to do it. And then, well, you know, I have a 16-year-old kid. He's now experimenting with drugs and stuff. It's like, well, I really, 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 really not advise you to do it. And if I say that I'm forbidding it, yeah, forbidding doesn't work. That's the end. There's no, nothing it, else you can fall back on. No, and, and forbidding doesn't work. You know, so... Uh, and it's with other stuff too. If you d if if they do something, you you try to define with them what is the cause and what is the aim and what is the you know what it brings you you know. And if it's a smart thing to do and it's a path to do or not, you know. But it's up to them. And of course, in the end, children need to experiment for themselves, not be guided by a parent or whatever, you know. No. Yeah. But that, that, even, that, even that, if I uh, even if I saw it already a million times, you know. <laughs> but still, wow, it, it's, do this. still, it still it reminds me of the, uh, uh, the 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 stuff that you try to experiment with as, as an artist. Everyone around you says, "Oh, you know, don't do that," or you know, yeah. just get a job as an accountant to work at a, at a desk. It's yeah. much safer. Don't worry about it. You're still gonna take all the risks. You're a painter. Uh, don't do silk screening. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you're gonna you now you're. You're teaching young kids uh, that they need to, yeah, yeah. They, they need to find their own way. But at the same time, you don't want them to run into big trouble. Yeah, but at the same time, it's like you know, there's no school for teach. There's no school for parents. You know, you can read all the books, but they're useless when the the problem uh, serves itself on your plate the next morning. It's always something you didn't think of mm. that you didn't expect. And then you need to reinvent yourself. Like from your first urge, like, no, you're crazy, don't do this. But it's like, oh, oh, wait, I did it myself, you know, like whatever, not even, it's like seven years ago, you know? And then so how how would you then, um, yeah, how, how would you respond to that? You know, like certain liberties that you don't want to give because you're afraid because da, 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 all the stuff that you saw what happened with your friends or with yourself or whatever. But it's like, yeah, you cannot project that on, on those kids. Mm -hmm. So you need to be more um, inventive than you thought you were because m quite a lot of times you just also follow the schemes of the, the models that you had before you, yeah. with your parents. But now the times have changed dramatically yeah 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 but not always in the good way no no that's not what i'm saying but at the same time yeah with social media with yeah. you know easy yeah. access to the internet uh they're gonna see stuff that you would not have seen when you were the same age maybe yeah. kids yeah. the kids that uh, if you want to have a beer you cannot have so you need to steal it from the supermarket. Mm -hmm. you know and with your mobile phone you just uh, send an sms and you get the whole uh drugstore uh, delivered in the park mm. in front of you being 15 so yeah that these are these are uh issues that are um different and also the stuff that they then bring to you are different than just the local wheat or hashish you know so it's that that's that's uh that's very challenging you know how you, how you deal with that yeah yeah we don't have that problem that much in the countryside uh, the countryside, the, I don't know. I th the, yeah. the drug courier is less. Uh, at my time, we didn't have the drug courier around the corner. Yeah, but you're old too. Huh? I'm old Thanks. compared to <laughs> no. But if you yeah, have yeah, like, no, yeah. a, I'm twice the age of your children. No, uh, compared least, to yeah. someone now being 15, you yeah, know. Yeah. So that's 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 another thing, you know. And yeah, yeah. in 15 years time, a lot changed. You no, know? no, because I'm. I I can imagine uh, back in my day, you would go on uh, MSN. 
to have a chat with your friends. And if they were yeah. not online, you could send them a message, but they would only read it when they came online. Yeah, yeah. We didn't have mobile phones yet. If you want to chat with your friends, you call yeah. them or you go by their house. Yeah. And that already was a big difference compared to, you know, my parents where if you want to have contact with your friends, you yeah, and have kids to... And now, you know. they are, they are uh, post-corona, you know. They were like, for two years, they were grounded at home. They just had contact through the screens with their yeah. friends, you yeah. know. So there was, and you you can't imagine, you know, two years is a long time for me. But you know, like, for me, it's like a black hole. This Corona time, and so I, I say, yeah, when was this? Like, yeah, five years ago. No, man, it was seven years ago because it's like a two yeah. year bl uh, blank, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. But for um, for my kids, two years is like forever. Yeah, because you know? they're what sixteen, so it's from fourteen to sixteen, yeah, or or the twelve year old, you know, yeah. like. Like between nine and eleven, he was at home doing homeschooling, whatever on on uh, on the screen on on a, on a computer. You know, he never had a computer, and now he's like sucked into the computer because of that. You know? Can you draw a parallel between the uh, the role of a parent, the, the 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 what you were talking about, the complexity of not knowing what you're gonna run into or what you have to really provide them because things are always fake to the role of a teacher at the art academy because what the they will come up with is always you know you have no clue what kind of stuff they'll come with next week you know there's yeah. a that when we're talking about the an autonomousness of mm -hmm. the of the child yeah. um they're now they're going from five-year-old to ten-year-old mm -hmm. they can go cycle on their own to school and now all of a sudden they go out with their friends and Maybe they come out re home really late. Mm -hmm. uh, they're getting to the point where they're gonna leave home, and you're not gonna see them for maybe a month, two, three, yeah. maybe a year, yeah. depending on where they're going to live. Yeah. Um, uh, so slowly, bit by bit, they are gonna run run into more autonomous problems as well, yeah. and and ideas about things. And when I thought about um, what you, when you were talking about being a parent, I mm -hmm. immediately had to think about being in art school where you have teachers yeah. that really, there's no one way. You can't go, mm. you, you can learn, you can go to an, a school and get a degree in becoming an arts teacher. But I have high doubts about the quality of, or the, 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 the function of such a degree really because of, you know, mm. uh, what the, um, what are you going to really teach them is how to, deal with life on their own how to deal with being an artist on your own yeah absolutely absolutely i mean and you know the difference between a parent and a teacher is the fact that um if your child as a parent if your child fucked up fucks up i mean it's you need to solve this you know with the kid or you need to be there full time 24 7 you know even if you don't see your child for five years Still, after a moment, if he comes back or if she comes back, you need to be there and you will be there. And as a, as a teacher, it's different. Your commitment is a prof professional commitment um, in the frames of, of the, the job uh, description, description yeah. more or less, you know. But, and of course, you know, it's not that, that flat, but I think in the end, you just, you know, if you're how I see it anyway, as an artist, you, everything I do, I do as an artist, even my parenting, I do as an artist, you know, and, um, I cannot switch this off more or less. And, and with teaching as well, it's like your commitment with your, your, your students is that you, you try to, um, challenge them and, and try to show them the potentials of where back doors might be. And in the end, they still, they need to make stupid mistakes, yeah. you know? And my parents, my, my children, they're not allowed to make stupid mistakes, but they will be, they will. And the space is there, you know? And I mean, the difference is if a student fucks up, as a teacher, I don't need to mop the floor, mm, you yeah. know? And that's a kind of a tricky thing. And that's like, you know, I think this is a questionable thing also. Really? I think it's cool to to be 
completely committed, you know, as a, as a, as a parent. Yeah, know? yeah. No, yeah, I agree fully. Because there's also parents who wash their hands and walk away. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I don't want to be a parent like that. No, but, no, I can yeah. understand. But I mean, there, and I yeah. think a lot of trauma uh, that causes people to dysfunction comes from not having a proper connection. Yeah. At least I was thinking about this very often now that I, I, I have my studio near to my parents yeah. at the same plot of land. Yeah. So I get a connection with my parents very directly. Yeah. And then finally, after a new four form. years, yeah. I finally get to know them. Yeah. Because now I can think more as an adult than I could 15 years ago. Yeah. 15 years ago, I wanted to run away. Now... Yeah, but I, you in the time, you know, like having uh, thinking about my 12-year-old kid... I need to be a different person Absolutely. towards my 12 year old and I need to create different spaces or freedoms or frames for my 12 year old and for my 16 year old or when he will be 20 or when they were like five years. You know? Yeah, but at the same time, I f feel that they're, they haven't changed that much. They're still the same person, but they... No, they changed completely. Really? Yeah, really, completely. Okay. Well, also, maybe a lot of stuff happened in between. Yeah, it's true. But it's like how how th how how things are. No, no, but I'm not talking about how they treat me. Just the way of where they come from, their basis of personality and character, and that's still. Yeah, the but same. there's a lot of projection involved. Eh? Like for you, as a as a person, in, like as a, as a son of your parents, let's say, you expect certain things from your parents, and with it, you also block th that relationship mm -hmm. and also mm -hmm. the possibility. Of how you, uh, which course you want to want to go, you know, it's a kind of your 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 pre ideas, pre um, how do you call this, like uh, pre framed uh, presuppositions. Yeah, they they are um, uh, all those difficult words, <laughs> but they oh. they are um, um, kind of also restraining us, you know, in that way, and and it's mm -hmm. very difficult to to. To untwingle what is what. Yeah, you know? yeah I think and you're right. What is yeah. your own idea? And like me, I'm being um, uh, 54 now. My relationship with my parents is like, it's, I need to redefine this now in another way than 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Now my parents become older, uh, more fragile, more close to death, you know, within now and whatever 30 years you know they might one of them might fall away you get a reconstellation of things my, my responsibility becomes bigger in this and it's like oh, fuck i'm just a kid of my parents and now i like uh, you know the the, the you whole still balance, feel, you still feel like their child i still i i i have a brother um that is my older brother and he was more like the, the dominant alpha guy uh, you know, and but he became sick, wounded sick, and now he's he's still around, but he's like um, he's not the the organizer anymore, you know, and uh, brain damage, all that kind of stuff. So so it, it caused a recalibration, a shift of polars. But it's like, fuck, I'm not ready for this. I don't know how to do this, this kind of thing. So it's really interesting, like that you need to redefine yourself, and also like. Suddenly I realized like as a parent also that my relation to my kids also is changing all the time. Yeah. So and also my relationship to my parents. Now this happens me being in my 50s and my parents being in the, the late six, 70s, 80s. But like maybe 15 years ago the same happened. It's constant moving, you know? Yeah. No, because what, what, what I always think about is when I see my parents... I notice that there are certain things that I run into that I recognize myself in. You know, when my I see my mother having an issue with her boss, I know that this is an issue with authority that I too yeah. have a problem with. Yeah. And I think in a certain way that I inherited this problem that she has, whether it's through through DNA or character or through upbringing or the way how they look at the world. But we share this similar way of dealing with stuff. Yeah, and uh, I noticed that I'm young enough to shape myself in different ways to overcome it in a way, mm -hmm. and she's still in this position where she finds it really difficult to get out of it. Yeah, and uh, we talk about this very often, and 
Um, but I noticed that she didn't, didn't change that much in that aspect over mm -hmm. the past decades. And maybe I won't be able to change it for myself. But being aware of it and being able to talk about it has changed. Because 15 years ago, yeah, and if you see I was not a, able to have the discussion. And if discussion. you see it as a potential handicap, then you need to be extra aware of it. Mm. You know, yeah. If it's just a, a character that you, you know, a character element that you can also use in a positive thing, okay, good for you. If it's like also kind of uh, limiting you, yeah, I mean, take the fruits and, and kick out the rest, you know, that's it. But yeah, it's, I mean, what is different, different of course, within between the generation of your mother and you is the fact that now it's much easier to get in depth of these things, you know, like in the, in the eighties or the nineties, it was not so, I mean, there was no internet. You couldn't Google it. No. So you need to talk with the guy, make an appointment, da, 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 go on course. It was not very accessible. Now like self study and, Self-development or self-development, self yeah, yeah. you know, psychology is all around. You, we can we can get into it in a sneaky iPhone moment on the bed if you want, you know, if you don't want to, you know, you can do uh, self-study even underground, you know, yeah, it's perfect, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know. So um, that's really different. Like my parents, I mean, for them, it was framed like, well, it's like, uh, so that, yeah, it's, it, they didn't do so much uh, with them, like, reflecting themselves especially my father he just he was like on a, on a train track and he just moved from from his 22nd year until whatever he's now he becomes 80 you know it's like it's like a ongoing thing and no what with all the handicaps that came along you know to wrap it, everything up what's come on what's next for you how, how, how long have we well, we've been. I think we've been recording for an hour and a half now. <laughs> What's next for you? Because we were we were talking about change now. Is there is there you gonna stay doing the same thing, or are you gonna? Because one one thing that I thought about, but I didn't know to say yet. What I was thinking might be an interesting thing. You were talking about well, I'm running in circles now because I can run in a square, and that's just like you know. A, 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 a different yeah. shape, but you yeah, know still why the not? Same. Still the yeah. same. Yeah. There's this um, the longest um, path on Earth, you know, mm. which you can run from one side to the other side. It's like yeah. the south tip of Africa, all yeah, the way, all to, the the, way to, uh, to the to Kamchatka. Uh, yeah. Nobody's ever run that. No, but w when I ran from Rotterdam to the German uh, to the the Dutch German border and then ran along to Hanover and then I moved to um, to Berlin. I realized when once I arrived in Berlin, I was super fit, fitter than ever, that I could have run to Warsaw, I could have run to Moscow, I could have won, run to Kamchatka. Once you um, understand the machine, you can maintain it and you can continue. Yeah. Of course, you can get hit by a truck or whatever, you know, mishap. Okay, but if not, you can do this. You can run from the south of Africa to the, the, the northeast of, uh, of Asia. You know, it, it's, it's possible. But you need to commit. That's the only thing. And it has to do with time. I have two kids now. I, I don't have the time anymore. But when they're 18? 18? When they're 18, I am uh, 60 and... I want to commit my time in other stuff. You know, I like to be an artist, making art, studying it, and the long distance running, what it offered me, um, it offered me. And if I run instead of 700 kilometers, 1200 or something like that, or or 2000 or 7000 it doesn't change so much in the in the in the material i think in the sense that what i got out of it as a um, um, the insight that it gave me um, the physical tool that that my body became the understanding in how things work 
like with my, you know, the, the, the joints and the injuries or the potential injuries and all this kind of stuff, how to, to deal with this. This is really fascinating, but it's, this is material. And what you do with it, it's, um, this is the key thing, you know. Mm -hmm. I ran to mm -hmm. Berlin mm -hmm. to prepare my body for certain things. And now I'm, my body is prepared and I can use it, you know. And or at least for a certain time. I become older, I, I feel that it's getting uh, uh, less strong, more injury sensitive. So there will come a time that I'm not able to run as I'm doing it right now. You no, know? but is, it, is the running, like let, let's call it running in circles, uh, gonna be something you're gonna try to keep up as long as possible? Or is there other stuff that you're looking at already you think, well... I'm doing other stuff. You know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, of course now the, the circles are... Um, in the scope, I, I, as, I, as I said in the beginning, I'm doing this kind of stuff like more than 25 years now. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, they said, oh, you're the guy from the stickers with the fly. And because I put like thousands of stickers of flies everywhere. And so, and then at a certain time, I grew out of that. I grew into doing other stuff. And then I, I invented the kind of a fake game. It was called The Art of Urban Warfare, where I, I wrote a text. I invited people to cut out stencils and spray it in one of the gr three game colors, green, blue, or brown, in the streets, like spraying a, a, a stencil of a soldier figure on a on an electric box or whatever, on a wall somewhere, etc. Then people said, oh, you're the guy from Art of Urban Warfare. For like a period of three years, more or less, people saw me as that guy. Yeah. Then after it was like the guys from from the Geen Stijl, this website with all the the, the anti art positions, like yeah, artists are lazy, a good artist is a dead one. All the quotes I spread those quotes as uh, as as one liners outside in in kind of graffiti things, and so then people associated me with that, and they did not make the bridge with the other things. So now I'm doing this running circle things. I mean, there's some other stuff in between, but it's like kind of the, the fourth, fifth kind of peak that I, I that that of interest that uh, that people gave me. Well, yeah, it's like Picasso's blue blue period. Now you something have something like, like that. Yeah, something, yeah. and and I don't know. I'm I'm just full of energy, and I'm I'm curious about this uh, about about art and and my city life, and it doesn't stop. You know, the circles, I'm now growing slowly out of what I did before, like two years ago, into something new, uh, as I said, with, with this, this war landscapes, yeah. um, to put them all together, to see where this goes. I have a big show in um, the end of November in in uh, Italy, in an art fair. It's a kind of a solo booth thing. And after in France... In uh, Rouen, I'm going to have a, a big uh, museum show. So I'm building a lot of material now, and like puzzle pieces, you know, like running all these different landscapes and also trying to um, uh, approach the landscape in another way, like historical or like infrastructure style, as I said, like with the motorways or like on a personal intimate way, like walking the paths of my youth or whatever, you know, this kind of stuff. And to see if I can build, um, I don't know, a, a, um, a story with it, you know, in a way, an abstract story in a way that contains different chapters that tell something about how I see life now, you no. know, about life and death and love and, and, and the tragedy of the period that we are living now, you know. But, but uh, do you have a feeling, that from what I uh, can subtract from what you're talking about, is you have a certain undertone, a certain theme that runs through your practice. Yeah. A certain uh, anarchism, you know, uh, maybe uh, challenging authority. Uh, there is this questioning of uh, uh, certain tapestries or fabrics of the way things are. And mm -hmm. Putting question marks in that. Wouldn't you, when you were being told, oh, you're the art, uh, the the, the uh, art of war? No, the, the uh, yeah, art of urban warfare, warfare, yeah, yeah. Uh, urban warfare kind of guy, or the kind of guy from running around. Wouldn't you want to be uh, rather be uh, recognized as the guy who questions these 
fabrics or really much more yes the, but the, the, the running theme that's in your work it will and it is by some people the thing is like i'm a i'm a very experimental artist and it means that i'm in the kind of in the avant-garde of the definition of these kind of languages and the people that define those things they're in the middle field you know before you end up with a small article in the Volkskrant, let's say, or whatever, some, some art magazine. You already do this stuff for two years. Yeah. So by, but by the time that you get this little text, you are already in your experimentation much further. Yeah. So you need to kind of slow down the pace and experiment and be more precise use that time to be more precise because you need to wait. It's like running ahead of the fanfare, you know, it's this kind of Dutch expression. I don't know if it's the same in English, but you know, you have this dance maricus and then the parade through the city. And there's this one guy in front with the big stick yeah. deciding the course, you know, with, and, and he's like, okay, we go to the left and he puts the stick to the left and the whole parade goes to the left and then to the right. And he, he gives all the marks of the, of what the, 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 the music core needs to do. And there's this expression that the guy that leads the parade runs too fast. So everybody could not uh, follow up anymore, you know? And it's with, with if you are into experimentation and the, the reflections that, that, you, that you do on your own art and your own experiments, and if they go too fast, or if they, they go really fast, it's hard for some people to follow that up. Mm -hmm. It could mm -hmm. be, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of a, I don't give a shit, but <laughs> that's the trend. <laughs> because I just move, it's my pleasure to just... Do what you do. Do what I do, experiment yeah. with what I do. And if people don't follow it, well, then they just need to read up or, you know, or listen to the podcast or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in that case, if you <laughs> if you thought that this the was the golden <laughs> finishing line, <laughs> if you thought that this was a good moment to go and check out Jeroen Jongeleen's website, you have to go to www.jeroenjongeleen.nl dot nl or uh, Google or Google or Google him. Yeah, then uh, you end up at completely different worlds, galleries. Uh, you're everywhere. Police reports. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Max, do you have a mug shot? Uh, no, no, not really. No, but in the Netherlands we have the passport. That's oh, yeah. even more efficient than the Mac shot. Okay, well, send me a picture of your passport. I'll use it as the thumbnail <laughs> yeah. for the <laughs> Google it. <laughs> Google it. Thank you for listening to Art Safari. Art Safari is made possible with the support of the Mondium Fund, the Municipality of Enschede, Willebank Foundation, and Bauerheim Foundation. For more episodes, you can find us on Spotify or visit www.artsafari.show. Or you check out our YouTube channel, where all episodes of Art Safari are available to listen to and to watch. Until the next time.